Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening, I'm John Miko, the Executive Director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. It's my great pleasure to be with you for tonight's uh, very special library hour here in beautiful uh, UL National. Uh, the Legacy Foundation, as you all know, is the nonprofit charity of the League. We use the history, the values, the spirit of this great institution, the Union League of Philadelphia, for all of the programs that we do, whether they be civics education or scholarships, lectures, exhibits, publications. Uh, all that we do is inspired by that first line in our bylaws, every member shall support the Constitution of the United States and the free enterprise system. We have wonderful programs scheduled uh, through this fall. Uh, we're going to kick things off on September 14th with a program which is really a kickoff to the year. It's a celebration. Uh, it's a preview of what is to come. Uh, many of you have received invitations to that just in the last probably day or two. Uh, if you haven't, um, you can find out how to do that. Uh, it has something to do with making a contribution uh, by, <laughs> by seeing Kira or me or emailing Legacy Foundation, and we'd be thrilled to send you an invitation to that very special, uh, that very special evening. Uh, so a few items before we start our program. Please silence your cell phone, or better yet, uh, turn them off. Our program will be uh, about an hour long. We are streaming live. So therefore, and we will have a Q&A section, so please use the microphone so everyone can hear you, not just here, but who is watching um, on, uh, on our YouTube channel. And as always, and we've had some problems in the last couple of programs with this, we have stopped short. John has not yet cut anyone off, but he will, if need be, three or four sentences. Um, and a question mark on the end. And if you haven't, if you can't do that, you have failed. So please, that's a question. Um, so please use the microphone and uh, our, our speaker tonight will um, moderate that. A few uh, upcoming programs um, on the 21st of September, uh, Civil War Brothers, which is the uh, story of the many uh, leaders in the Civil War Union and Confederate that were friends, that were classmates at West Point. And then we kick off our Liberty Series this year with Bob Woodson. Uh, Bob Woodson is an inspiring civil rights leader. Uh, he has founded the 1776 Project, which is a, in part an answer to the 1619 Project. Uh, he's an inspiring speaker, and I'm sure you want to be there um, on 10-3 on October 3rd. A lot of people to thank for this. Thank you, John and, and Ed, our AV team, for making the trip down. And of course, as always, Kira. Jacob, thank you for uh, hosting us this evening in this wonderful property, this beautiful setting. We appreciate uh, being down here with you. And of course, I will introduce, who's going to introduce our program, uh, the one, the only, Mr. Jim uh, Mundy. Jim. All right. Well, thank you very much. I don't know why people clap, but what the heck. <laughs> so. Uh, I think we all know that the League is different and unique in many, many, many ways, but who would have thought that it was a League family that was actually the subject of a shark attack on Long Beach Island that then led to the creation of a novel called Jaws that led to a movie called Jaws. So the Union League is everywhere <laughs> in, in, in good and in bad situations, so it's just absolutely amazing that uh, that the league is that connected. And it just always amazes me that we can find these connections no matter where we go. And I guess, Mike, when, when did, so we had you speak at the league, what, about 20 years ago, was it? Yes, when the book first came out. And the out. book first came out. So, yeah, and, uh, and after all, we're not that far from Beach Haven, so what the heck? So it's a good place. So, so obviously this is Michael Capuzzo, our guest speaker this evening. Uh, Mike's from Boston, but he saw the light and he came to Philadelphia. <laughs> and. Uh, he, his original profession was as a journalist, so he wrote for the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Miami Herald. He was nominated six times for Pulitzers, regretfully didn't win one. But just the fact that you have six notches in your gun, so to speak, is really pretty amazing when you think about that. Uh, so Mike has also uh, wrote articles for, I guess, and numerous magazines, Sports Illustrated, Reader's Digest, and just to give you the, the two ends of the, the journey, if you will, there. So we are uh, just really very fortunate and incredibly lucky that uh, that Mike was willing and available to come this evening. So 
Michael, if you would please tell the league members about the Van Zandt and their league connections. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. And it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I, you know, when I first spoke at the Union League, it was in Philadelphia. Now I see you have all these properties. So I hope I, I, hope I can come back three more times, you know, to, <laughs> to uh, and it looks like I might be able to because I didn't really run out there for breaking news, but I was going to tell you that I did because I got breaking news from John Miko. Uh, the, the Pulitzer nominations were for my books, this and, and the murder room. Uh, but the breaking news that John told me, despite my apparent ability to research, is you guys have better ability to research. And the fact is the the first shark attack victim in the United States who's launched this whole drama that has changed all of our lives was from Philadelphia. But his father, which I did not know till tonight, was a member of the Union League. Uh, and I think that's amazing. Um, but we'll get into that. So let me see. I'm pretty low tech, but I did a PowerPoint once before and people lo loved it. So bear with me here, um, even though it was a Philadelphia audience, which I know is pretty tough. Um, so I guess anybody of a certain age knows that that's who that is sitting in the mouth of what that is, which is Bruce, the mechanical shark in Jaws. Uh, and I'm going to tell you how Jersey Shore and Jaws changed the world. It's just really an incredible story. And I, I seem to be have been chosen by whatever fates or God in the world to know it better than anyone in, the, in, in, in life. So I'm I'm excited to tell it to you because you're not really seeing it in even places like I like, like the Wall Street Journal, et cetera, all put together in one place. Um, so let's start with the movie that changed Hollywood and the natural history of the oceans. All that happened, um, I, should I should hasten to say, because of New Jersey, 1916, because of this magnificent shore. Uh, parenthetically, I love it here. My wife and I, you know, if I was a politician, I'd say we met here and got engaged here, but that's not true. <clears throat> um, we, we did. We did meet and get engaged in Philadelphia. We worked for the Philadelphia Inquirer together, and that's how I discovered this story and became lucky enough to be the first person really to unearth this true story that Jim referenced of the true story of Jaws was really unknown until I did this book. Um, and I, let me see, this is really the high tech moment. So uh, hopefully this goes okay. Um, how do I, is this a touch screen? How do I hit that? Well, you know, maybe I'll just go low tech. Um, You've all seen Jaws, and there's actually a scene I was going to play for you, but I don't need to, uh, where uh, Richard Dreyfus is the, bio, you know, the biology the biologist, and you see that picture up on the right hand uh, side, and um, uh, Murray Hamilton is the mayor, and Murray Hamilton doesn't want to close the beaches because of business uh, problems, and the uh, here we go. Here's someone who knows what they're doing. Oops. Oh, okay. Ah. Play it or... Yeah, sure. Play? Yeah. Great white Larry, a big one. And any shark expert in the world will tell you it's a killer. It's a man eater. Look, the situation is that apparently a great white shark has staked a claim in the waters off Amity Island. And he is going to continue to feed here as long as there is food in the water. And there's no limit to what he's going to do. I mean, we've already had three incidents. Two people killed inside of a week, and it's going to happen again. It happened before. The Jersey Beach, 1916, there were five, five people, people chewed up in the surf. In one week. Tell them about the swimmers. A shark is attracted to the exact kind of splashing and activity that occurs whenever human beings go in swimming. You cannot avoid it. If you open the beaches on the 4th of July, it's like ringing the dinner bell, for Christ's sake. Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, I pulled a tooth the size of a shot glass out of the rectal of a boat out there, and it was the tooth of a great white. It was Ben Gardner's boat. It was all chewed up. I helped tow it in. You, sh you should have seen him. Where, where is that tooth? Did you see it, Broden? No, I didn't see it. He, he dropped it. Yeah. I had you get the idea. Tell him about New Jersey. Tell him about 1916. Uh, that story first happened, the true story happened in Beach Haven, Matawan, and um, uh, Spring Lake, and not in Massachusetts. And, and I'll, I'll tell you the inside story from family members of how Peter Benchley ripped that off and made it into Jaws. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're in the present. There's so many stories here. John's going to go like this when I go over because you want to do Q&A. But this is the history of sort of like the history of the friggin' world here, pardon the, pardon the French. Uh, shark attacks return to pre-pandemic uh, levels. These are the sun, these are the headlines we all see now. In the lower left-hand corner, this is an actual photograph. I just, there's a frenzy of this. We all see it on media all the time. I just picked this off the internet yesterday. This is an actual photograph of an actual great white in, uh, I believe it's Australia, taken by a famous photographer who happened to find, you know, the, 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 the movie poster, show, uh, Jaws. And it's like, how did this happen? How did the world get filled with great white uh, sharks and great white shark stories? Um, we have to go back to Cape Cod in 1966, which is a golden age. 
And actually, I think it was a golden age because that's approximately the year the fellow on the right uh, hugging the, the kilty, the collie, is me. And uh, that's my dad, who was very um, gregarious. He was a salesman, and he had a great gregarious personality. I've never seen him look like that. He, I, I guess he had at least three Manhattans when, you know, when, that, when that picture was, was taken. But you know, you look back, 1966, Robert Kennedy is thinking of running for president. They, they believed in free speech back then, and there they are marching at Berkeley for free speech. Um, you know, Louis Armstrong is still alive. And I went swimming in Cape Cod. My parents took me down, because I grew up in Boston, born in Boston, and my parents took me down to the beach. And they wouldn't even look up when I went in at five, six feet of water for four hours at a time. And I'd come out and, I'd come out and fill this little basket, you know, with um, fiddler crabs and shells and, you know, Dad, Mom, look at this. I'll go back in the water. And they just, they just didn't care. And now that cannot happen on Cape Cod. And that's partly the story we're going to tell. Um, Henry David Thoreau is really famous for writing Walden, uh, obviously. And you think if you've been to Walden Pond, it's a pretty tame place. He wrote an equally spectacular book called Cape Cod, where he, he, he spent months going up and down as a, the naturalist that he was. And he said, they will tell you, so this is partly this talk is a time travel talk. So you can see here, we're now in 1866, we've gone back 100 years to try to understand what happened to the Jersey Shore, what happened to the East Coast of the United States, and why it's happening again. Um, let's look a little closer at this book, Cape Cod, that Thoreau wrote in 1866. If you look here with me, he says on the left, the ocean there is commonly a tantalizing prospect in hot weather. For all that water before you, there is, as we were afterward told, no bathing in the Atlantic side on account of the undertow and the rumor of sharks. My God, it sounds like the New York Times today, right? And then you get down here and it says, one old wrecker told us he killed a regular man-eating shark right where he was swimming. And another, uh, they will tell you tough stories of sharks all over the Cape, which I do not presume to doubt utterly, how they sometimes upset a boat, tear it to pieces to get at the man in it. That actually happened in the, seven, in the 1700s, well, I think it's the 1700s, off of um, uh, Cape Cod Bay. And that's a whole other story. I'll have to write a book about that. But the guy was basically taken out of his boat by this giant sea monster, and, and people witnessed it. You know, and they're in like, like, you know, 1700s kind of stuff. So now I was able, lucky enough to be able to swim on Cape Cod when I was 10 years old, 12 years old. Now uh, I went to investigate what the heck happened at Cape Cod and, and why that young man died in 2018 and why no one can swim in Cape Cod anymore. Like I was able to swim carefree as a child. And Dr. Greg Skomal, who is, if you're into sharks and you always see him, good looking guy, he's the top uh, shark biologist it, really in the, in the Western North Atlantic. And he's the one who was sitting there in Massachusetts in 2004 when there had not been a great white shark on the on the on the um, Massachusetts coast until pretty much like you know Thoreau walked up and down it or or um, you know uh, 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 what's his name went off on his sailing ship to write the uh, the great American novel on on um, on you know on whales. But Skomal says he won't let his kids go in anymore because he's seen too much. I mean. You know, I talked to surfers, I talked to people who would be surfing and a great white would come up right under them and go up and look at them like this. Uh, and they all have names too. So, you know, there's like a, a great white literally could be almost the size of the length of this room. And while it's chewing your leg off, you can say, but Christy, but Christy, I know you have a lot of fans on social media. It's me, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, so Chatham now uh, it advertises itself as the summer home of the great white. And if you look at this map there, you can see just in the last 10 years or so, um, this tremendous rebound, that's the pinging of the uh, O-Search uh, tagged Great Whites up and down the East Coast. It's now become, Cape Cod is now the, the, the Atlantic Ocean capital of the Great White Shark. And because of that, it's like I-95. They're like snowbirds. They go back and, back and forth. Well, a stretch of beach in Cape Cod is now off limits to swimmers after a shark killed a 26-year-old man there. Eyewitnesses say Arthur Medici was boogie boarding off Newcomb Hollow Beach Saturday afternoon. That's when this shark suddenly attacked. People did try to revive him, but he was pronounced dead at the hospital. It's the first, first deadly shark attack in Mass Massachusetts since 1936. So this story begins in Massachusetts, but now we go to why, how that really happened. Um, that young man who died in 2018 died in almost exactly the same way uh, Charles Van Sand, whose father was a member of the Union League, died in 1916. Uh, for, and for a lot of the same reasons. Um, this is just one of my favorite quotes from Thomas uh, uh, Wolfe. 
that shows how all these <laughs> all these stories fit together in such a bizarre way. So you can read it yourself. It's I really probably should cut that out if I'm going to get to Q and A. Anyway, um, this is not a great white shark. This is the great white shark scientist. Um, and I only make that joke because he obviously weighs about 300 pounds. And in in uh, when I did the first talk before the Union League, and this was a New York Times bestseller, I wrote close to shore. But he was a main scientific source for me. Uh, he came up from the University of Florida, where he runs the International Shark Attack File, which is the conglomeration, the record keeping of 500 years of shark attacks. Only scientists can look at it. I mean, it's so sort of horrifying in a way. They won't let anybody else look at it. And, you know, the Navy started it, uh, and it's the Smithsonian has run it, and he runs it. And he actually is the one that decided a great white shark killed all these people in New Jersey officially. And on my invitation, he came up from the University of Florida, and we took a boat on on Matawan, and he got to the bottom of what happened to this shark uh, mystery. Meanwhile, a couple of years ago, just before COVID, you know, remember the before time? Um, we, uh, he went, we went on a boat together up Matawan Creek, and he, uh, that was when I mentioned, and he tested the salinity and everything. But then a couple of years ago, um, we went up to Cape Cod and he took me on a 10 day tour of the entire Cape Cod, all the attack sites where that young man died to try and find out how that happened and why that happened. Um, but if we go back in time further, so we're bouncing around here, 1966, 1866, a lot of sixes here. Now we're in uh, 1916. This is the Engleside Inn in Beach Haven. Now I'm sure a lot of you recognize it. This, uh, this was the Engleside in uh, 1916. And it was a temperance house, just like Ocean City. There was no drinking there. And, um, and there, these were these Victorian women with their hats, uh, Edwardian that by that point. Uh, and it was an age when, you know, the vigor was, was the order of the day from, from Theodore Roosevelt. And this is Charles Van Sant, uh, the poor young man who was the first shark attack victim. He had recently graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he went in the uh, shallow water, just like Arthur Medici in Cape Cod. Uh, more than a century later and attracted the attention of this rogue great white shark uh, and um, uh, you know was all the flesh was stripped off his thigh his left thigh and he was hauled to shore and his father the member of the Union League who was a very famous um, specialist when specialists were a brand new thing in medicine he was an ear nose and throat man uh, and one of the thrills of this kind of research is I was in the library at the Jefferson medical school, you know, Jefferson University, and because I know he went there, and they brought out this ancient book, and I'm looking through these tattered pages, and there it is, the record of his studying, you know, around the Civil War, and his preceptor, his mentor, his teacher was Samuel Gross, of the Samuel Gross Clinic, you know, the famous, uh, um, so anyway, he tried to save his son's life, obviously, Charles Van Sant today, with any kind of quick response, would have lived, and would have been drinking, you know, you know, margaritas that night telling his friends about it, but he was the first shark attack victim. And then um, uh, this, you'll meet these characters later, poor Lester Stilwell, the young boy on the left and Tr Stanley Fisher, 24, coming up. Uh, this is the creek where Lester was swimming uh, in, behind a tomato packaging factory at two in the afternoon. The first attack was July 1st, 1916. And the second one was July 6th, uh, 1916. Um, and I'm sorry, we've jumped too far ahead in the story. I, who did this PowerPoint? Oh, I did. Um, it, anyway, uh, we're forgetting a really crucial part of the story. If we can go back and suspend the shark right now, he's swimming around and he's killed one person, Charles Van Sant, who's unfortunately tragedy. It's not really in the papers at all. This was a fairly con obviously conservative era. CNN and Fox are not around. The Discovery Channel is not making money off shark attacks and, and nothing makes the papers. Nobody even believes it was a shark. Um, and then five days later, July 6th, uh, all, it, this was, a, and I should have a picture of this, my apologies, but this imagine this grand as possible. It still stands. The Essex and Sussex Hotel is now a condominium in Spring Lake. And that was a very grand hotel where um, Grover Cleveland was president of the United States and he was making a speech on July 4th that, there. Uh, he wasn't president, he was a former president. The president was um, uh, Woodrow Wilson and Woodrow Wilson was running the United States from a bank building in Asbury Park. And he would literally, I think of him patting down in his slippers, but I don't think that's true. He would walk down the hall to meet the quote, gentlemen of the press. And there are probably no more than there are here. And the federal government bureaucracy uh, fit on that bank floor basically so it's a slightly different era and he was running for re-election on 
uh, he kept us out of the war. This is 1916. So with all these people there, poor Charles Bruder, who's a Swiss bellhop at the Essex and Sussex Hotel and had been in the Swiss Army and is a very vigorous swimmer who all the, likes to show off for all the young women and swim out. He swam out more than a football field and was practically bitten in half by a great white shark. Um, and uh, a society lady in, 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 um, from Philadelphia has happened to see the mutilated body with her opera glasses being dragged ashore and, and called the switchboard operators who put a warning up and down the East Coast from uh, you know 16 miles in every direction for every hotel, get out of the water. And there was panic. And there was a New York Times reporter on the beach to witness all this mutilated body being brought ashore. And this really is, you can start to see what uh, Peter Benchley stole for Jaws. I mean, this is really the first moment that later fictional scene in Jaws, it really did happen. There's panic. Uh, and then five, six days later, um, in a totally, I mean, we're talking now. So the first attack was in Beach Haven, which according to Google Maps is about 72 miles from right here to the Engleside Hotel Beach. But if you were a bird, it's only 60 or 55 miles. I don't know, I couldn't figure it out on the maps. But then another 45 miles north is Spring Lake. And now another 30 miles north of that, the same shark, arguably, it's a mystery, but George Burgess believed it, and he's the expert in shark attack science, wanders into basically a Midwest farm town where they're growing tomatoes and shipping them off, uh, what seems like a Midwest farm town, an agricultural town off Raritan Bay, down the Matawan Creek, where nobody's really near the ocean, but it gets back in there and attacks this young Lester Stilwell, who you saw on the left, that picture, and then and kills him. And then Stanley Fisher, uh, tried to go and in, went into the water to try to save him was also killed. Stanley again would have lived. I think Lester didn't really have a chance. He got dragged to the bottom. The speculation that he had an epileptic attack, but he was killed by the shark. And then uh, Stanley Fisher was a big vigorous guy, but and he got his leg shredded. But he had to wait like for an hour for the train to Long Branch to get to the hospital. So he would have survived today too. Um, and this was the reaction. Uh, the, the, rea the, the prototype in Jaws, what you see where everyone's furious and they start killing sharks, uh, was really happened in, in fictionally and, and was spurred on by the movie Jaws. A bunch of macho guys went out and started hunting for sharks to the dread of these shark scientists. Meanwhile, it really did happen in 1916. They brought dynamite down, a harpoon, you know, they took all the, all the weapons from the Civil War off the, off the mantelpiece and went down to try to kill um, this sea monster. E.O. Wilson was one of the greatest scientists of the 20th, 21st century, just recently died at Harvard, a zoologist. I was lucky enough to interview him. I didn't, he didn't tell me this, but we're not afraid of predators. We love them in a deeply tribal way. We love our monsters. So we see this kind of recurring story in human history. This is an image from St. George and the Dragon, a myth of you know, killing the monster. Um, and the response was just what we see today when there's a shark attack, but with the media of the time. The New York Times, the Washington Post, Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, and the Times, had the same sort of Victorian sober um, style, at least to look at that it does today, but they couldn't avoid like a New York Post headline, you know, man tor torn in half by fish. Now, what fish was it was the, was the question. The top shark scientist in, in 1916 was, was thought to be at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And he had two young prot protégés who were gonna become real top ichthyologists, but the, they really didn't know anything. They speculated it might be a great white shark, maybe a sea turtle, nobody knew. But there was panic and the businesses collapsed in the Jersey Shore for about, you know, for weeks. They lost 75% of their business. They lost an estimated uh, several million dollars, if not in, that, in today's dollars. Um, and there were lots of, you know, um, it became a political football. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was saying, well, Woodrow Wilson's just a wimp. You know, he, he not only let Americans be killed on the Lusitania and did nothing to stop the Germans, he's letting sharks eat Americans. Uh, Wilson held, held and, and he made, I don't know if he made direct comments like that, but he sort of, you know, uh, implied it, that that was the weakness. And Wilson held an emergency cabinet meeting at the White House to talk about eradicating all the sharks on the East Coast. Uh, his, um, the top sort of early Coast Guard officials said, Mr. President, we really can't do that any more than we can eliminate all the mosquitoes in your backyard. Um, so, it became, you know, the U.S. war on sharks. Uh, and now we're going to make another time machine leap. As a quick aside, I don't know if you recognize that. I've seen things. Greg Skomal, who's the top great white shark expert, was the first person to dive under the polar ice cap and swim with the Greenland shark. 
he discovered that that shark, the shark, the Greenland sharks, they move so slow and they're actually man eaters. So it took guts or rather flesh eaters, probably never seen a man till this, uh, lived three to 400 years. Um, anyway, we move, we move forward in time with all these major events and we get to son of Jersey man eater. This is Steven Spielberg again. And how does Jaws happen? I really discovered this when I went on this not very romantic trip with George Burgess, the great white shark hunter guy, scientist, right? So imagine him driving and me, okay, I'm, I could lose 30 pounds, but he, me in the other seat, and this Nissan Rogue is gray, and it happens at 15.33 feet, 3,488 pounds. The size of the Nissan Rogue is almost exactly the size of a full-grown great white shark. That's how big they are. I, I guess you just open the hood. It's like, imagine that with teeth. Um, so we're going up and down uh, in Long Island and Cape Cod, trying to figure out how the deaths happened, um, you know, back. And, and I met this woman, there's George on the left, and the woman on the right, on his right, is the daughter of Frank Mundus. And for those of you who are shark fans or whatever, Frank Mundus was famous in the 70s, 80s, 70s. There's a picture of him with a great white shark that he'd caught that ran in the New York Daily News, that the, the mouth of the shark could have encircled this whole lectern. And there's Frank next to it, like having killed it. Um, and he was very famous. And one day, his daughter hated him because he was so brutal to sharks. She went off to prove that she was tougher and became the captain of an Exxon tanker. Um, but she told me one day when he was like, she was 12 years old, he came home. He was sailing out of Montauk, Long Island, catching sharks, making a lot of money, publicity. And he said, you know, I had the weirdest client today. Um, he didn't want to fish. He just wanted to talk. And it was a guy named Peter Benchley. And he, Peter Benchley went to uh, publishers in New York City with in his back pocket, the New York Daily News picture of this shark. And in fairness to Peter Benchley, he had extensive knowledge of the water and had been around sharks and things his whole life. So he wrote this great sort of thriller novel. Here's Frank Mundus, one of his typical pictures on the right. I thought a nice little Jaws family. I said that sort of humorously because I was sort of welcome to this family. I wrote this book that brought this out and they were all like, hey, we have something in common here. I'm like an alumni of the, of the Jaws family somehow. It was kind of weird, but it was fun. Um, so Jaws, so Peter Benchley writes Jaws, and you know, it was a sensation. Again, this is the time, 1974, the book came out, it was a huge bestseller. Uh, Fidel Castro went on to say it was an example of the excesses of capitalism, this man-eating shark, you know, uh, and, and Nixon resigned. Patty Hearst, she's there at the left. I interviewed her, she, well, I won't say anything. Um, and Fidel and Jaws, so this is, this is our time back then. Uh, a star is born. Look at that handsome smile. Isn't that something? You know, it almost looks innocent, doesn't it? Like you know, like he plays little league when he's not out hunting seals. Um, but you can see with I don't know if this is the Philippines or whatever, but all over the third world, this is a massive. So really, what you're seeing, one of the elements of this story is the invention of the Hollywood blockbuster. This was the first one, and all the great or terrible movies that followed in the summer. You can blame Jaws, um, Meg, Pause. Um, so. When I'm traveling, this is when George and I were traveling in Cape Cod, and that picture was taken at the Chatham uh, Atlantic Shark Conservation, you know, uh, headquarters. And this was a headline this week in the Wall Street Journal on the left, our shark attacks, a sign of conservation success. Well, here, I'll tell you the, the nut of how all this ties together, which is Jaws is the best thing and worst thing that ever happened to sharks, according to George Burgess, because he was in graduate school when Jaws came out, and they all sat around, the scientists at their, and they, you know, they're get. He's in um, in University of North Carolina, uh, you know, uh, studying to be a marine scientist. And they said, and they went in, you know, in North Carolina, watched the movie, and they howled. I mean, all these things in the science is terrible. Like Richard Dreyfus says, this these cuts were handled by something a lot by a squalus something, and he used a Latin name. It's a Latin name for a spiny dogfish, which George says only bites you if you cut yourself when you're taking it off the hook, you know. So Jaws had all, and they, but they weren't, but they were horrified as scientists and naturalists at the reaction of the, the macho, as they thought of it, they characterized it, this macho American public that went out and killed sharks. So there was a growing environmental awareness to protect sharks. And ironically, by 1975, when the movie came out, what was going to save the life of the sharks in the future and ensure that a poor young man would die in, in Massachusetts, just like he did in New Jersey, was, was uh, federal legislation had been passed in 1972, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And that protected um, the animal on the left, the Atlantic seal. When I was swimming in Cape Cod, 
when Henry David Thoreau was swimming in Cape Cod, there were seals all over the place and all in the North Atlantic. By the time 100 years later, I swam, they'd all been wiped out. I mean, typical, you know, Massachusetts mayors would give you a dollar a seal pelt or whatever, and they've been wiped out by hunters, partly for survival of fishermen. Fishermen quickly found out that, the, you know, they're out to catch fish and a seal can eat. I mean, I don't know how many, you, probably people who have been on the water here can tell me, I forget like hundreds of fish in a day, you know, it's real competition. So I was able to swim, but once the Marine Mammal Protection Act, protection for great white sharks, but more importantly for the, for the seals that had moved up to Nova Scotia, moved back down. And it became this huge area, Cape Cod is huge colony of seals. And that's why it's dinner bell again. And that's why all the great white sharks they're sensitive to this. They go up and down the Pacific coast. They go up and down the Atlantic coast. And all of a sudden they said, hey, you know, there's really great, great new restaurants have opened up in New England. <laughs> and they all moved back. And that has led to um, these unfortunate insta instances. This is actually in the middle, the middle picture, uh, Greg Skomal filmed where he, he was watching this great white chase his seal. And the seal at the last instant made a move to save his life and was able to escape. Uh, this is what Skomal does. And I'm sure if you've seen Shark, Shark Week, he's on, you know, on all the time, several big features. Um, but the Great Whites, this is how Charles Bruder died off Spring Lake. The Great White is a, um, uh, a, a you know, a, a power killer. When I did another bestseller called The Murder Room, which I, it would, uh, the Vidoc Society used to speak at the Union League. Um, uh, Richard Walter is the world's expert on, on murder. And he says, it's just like a power killer and murder. It's they all power all the time. It's not like a sneaky thing, like they're going to poison you. Um, a, a certain types of murderers that hit you right in the face, just like the shark, right in the face, all power right up from a, an immense uh, thrust from the bottom of the ocean. And that's why they go flying out of the sea. And that's what happened to Charles Bruder, why he basically got cut in half. And poor this now we're in in, 19, in 2018, September 15th, is it? Um, and this is Arthur Medici. He's a handsome young boy who was going to college in um, Massachusetts, uh, he, he just, he was from Brazil, I believe, and moved up here, this sort of American, sort of global dream now. And this is his fiance. And he was out with his future brother-in-law, a younger boy. He's like in his twenties and brother-in-law is like 17, who witnessed this shark all of a sudden, you know, on him in very shallow water in Wellfleet because of the, because of the seals. I went in, I thought I have to do this, you know, I, I have to go in the water here. And I came, I went out, you know, and got about knee deep right where this had happened approximately. And I looked out and I thought I saw a coconut bobbing in, the, in, in a big wave about as far as away as that uh, piece of furniture in the back of the room. And it was a seal head. And I thought, you know what? It's time to get back on the beach. And because they, they, they're mistaking, um, this was just some of the adventures we had in Cape Cod where you know everybody there is so into sharks. Uh, and it's been a, it become a political football in Massachusetts because it really comes, this is another theme, another sort of thing that's happening in the world today. I don't know if you've heard of the, the trend called rewilding, but a lot of scientists or some scientists, or there's a movement, to, you know, it, it used to be in India when a, a, a Bengal tiger killed a villager, they'd shoot the tiger. Now they move the village because it's the habitat of the tiger. So if you go to Cape Cod, you'll have people tell you and you think, well, I should be able to swim. Maybe you could put up a shark net. You get a lot of shark net which you get a lot of hostility. It's, it's your ocean, not it's their ocean, not yours. So it really is the changing of one of the most beloved shorelines uh, in America. And, and uh, it, it may happen increasingly, certainly to Long Island. When George and I were uh, traveling, we, he's this legend. So the top uh, human resources or rather natural resources, uh, bureaucrats, administrative people in, in New York on Long Island met with him and said, what's gonna happen in Long Island? He said, you're gonna have a great white shark attack and death in the next five years. Uh, because because of the seals and the, and the migration. But another biologist I talked to there said, you know what, the great white shark, it's like from, from uh, devil to deity in one generation. Because the scene you see at the left was this 15 foot great white shark, about 50 years to the day when a 15 foot great white shark had become trapped in a bay on this, uh, the islands just south of Cape Cod. And the villagers of that town came out and beat it to death, right? Which is what you know, men do when they see a, a man-eating monster predator threaten their village, right? Well, uh, this is 50 years later, the villagers of Cape Cod came out and tried to save this shark that had sand, because they know how important it is to the environment that had beached. And they came out with, you know, pails and things. And, you know, I, and, and so there's a big effort to, 
rehumanize the great white shark. That's a New Yorker cartoon at the right where he's saying, I'm really not such a bad fellow after all. Um, and I get that. I, I, it's politics and it's environmentalism. Um, but when I'm asked, when I do media, the New York Times interviewed me as the historian of this a couple of years ago. It's like, let's not forget why the great white shark is so valuable to our environment. It's not because it's Bambi. It's not because he or she, you know, uh, helps old ladies across the street. It's because if he, if this creature walked out of that cartoon and in this room today, he'd only be happy if we all ran. I mean, that's his role in nature, you know. And and I I, I love the great white shark and appreciate it like I do thunder and lightning, you know. Uh, you know, you have to be careful, you know. But it's a great thing. Um, Jaws has become an iconic thing uh, in our culture. Obviously, whether you love Trump or hate him, you love Euro or hate him or the Dems. It's all Jaws cartoonists go nuts with Jaws, and I could I put up a hundred of these. Um, and I, you know, I started with my dog, uh, Kilty, in 1966, and I didn't want you to think that uh, the, the, the dog was going to die eaten by a shark, but that was a factor in the Union League uh, doctor's son's death, because he was swimming with the dog, and all the shark experts will tell you, you know, it's a no-no, you never go swimming with a dog. In general, I think you, you swim here freely, you never go swimming where there are Discovery Channel cameras, or where, you know, you know, or where the scientists say, you know, this great white sharks live here, you know, and there's also seals. Otherwise, the odds are decidedly in your favor. But anyway, I wrote books about dogs, too. I taught some dogs to be Frisbee dogs, not champions like I'm sure this one. But it really, if there's anything I want you to take from this talk is the magnificence of the Jersey Shore, the magnificence of nature, the magnificence of the great white shark, whatever we think of it. And um, I just couldn't help see the parallels here. Um, this is, uh, they're, they're now measuring record leaps after seals uh, for ear jaws. In, um, anyway, is it time for questions? Is this, uh, <clears throat> I try to go fast. <laughs> we have questions? Can you give us naive people context? Obviously, it's all great white sharks, but there are other sharks. Right. Um, talk to us about kind of what's the percentage of great whites? How much should we fear the normal shark if there is such a thing uh, versus the great white? Well, that's a great question. And I just want to assure you that I was when the book came out, I was on the Today Show live for five minutes with Al Roker. I was on CNN like five nights in a row. And every time someone would ask me, we want you to talk about lemon sharks, I'd call George and I'd say, George, what's a lemon shark? So anyway, I'm passing on to you what I've heard from scientists and learned as a reporter, because uh, I'm not a scientist. Um, George talks about the, the top three, there's more than 400 species of sharks. And most of them, I mean, there's some of them you can pet, right? And uh, um, the top three is, quote man eaters are in order the great white shark, uh, number two, the tiger shark, number three, the bull shark. And the great white has killed more people than any of those others. Um, and is also the most, I mean, George says they don't even know, they keep growing all throughout their lives. So they've caught, I think, 25 footers, but the crazy speculation is they could get, you know, twice that perhaps, you know. Um, and a, a tiger shark is also really huge. Uh, they can go 15, 20 feet. There's a uh, story in the book about uh, two guys who were chasing abalone in, um, off San Diego. And it was Jim and John. And Jim said, Jim. And he went under. And the other friend swam over. And his buddy was already up to the waist in the mouth of a tiger shark. And his, his friend tried to save him by pounding on this shark, just like pounding on the Nissan Rogue, I guess. And uh, the shark drove away with his friend into deep water. Um, and then the bull shark, which is thought to be the most dangerous of all, because the other two, you know, uh, one of the principles of nature is that big things are less numerous. So there was only one Will Chamberlain, you know, and there's a million ants, for instance. So there are not a lot of great white sharks. Um, uh, whereas the bull shark can go six, nine feet and is for somebody who's getting their thigh bit off is just as dangerous. And it's also, uh, can, has there been attacks up? 90 miles from the ocean up in a river in Iran and attacks up the Mississippi River near St. Louis. They go into brackish water and all over the world until 1966, they all had a different name and, and scientists realize it's one breed of shark. Somebody was, some, some guy tried to swim, not too smart, across Tampa Bay late one night at midnight and got, they made it halfway before Bill Shark ate him, you know, 
in the close to shore story, there's debate whether or not it was a bull shark. There are some people who believe it was a bull shark, not a great white that went up Matawan Creek because, because it's gone up a creek where they can live in brackish water. But George and I, George told me that, uh, in fact, it was more like a marine embayment and a great white could have gone up there. But in general, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please. Yeah, any more? John? Yeah, what's the lifespan of a shark? I mean, uh, yeah, what's the lifespan you know, of a shark? I, I mean, I don't really know. I think yeah. I think great whites. Have, I think they've moved, lived fifty or sixty years, but I I don't really know. Um, I know they live a significantly long time. But well, and that Greenland shark that I showed you the picture of, they are living to three and four hundred years old. So uh, they move very slowly. Maybe that's the key. I don't know. <laughs> Kira, question in the back. Has climate change affected any of this? You know, shark attacks, decreases, decreases. Did any what? What? I'm sorry, I missed that. Did, did climate has climate change affected? Well, when I when I was traveling with George, he didn't think that that was a major factor. Um, you know, uh, but the biggest factor by far is the presence of the food that they eat, and so it is an environmental story and an environmental comeback story. I tended to think of it as almost imagine a movie uh, in reverse, in black and white where, you know, uh, Herman Melville and others are killing these creatures and then these laws come in and now they're starting to come back. Certain bird species came back to Cape Cod and then seals, etc. And before you know it, it's pretty dramatic. Here comes the apex predator. It's like you rebuilt the whole pyramid for me. Here I am, you know. It, it's interesting going back to a very primitive time. Karen, another question in the back. <laughs> What I thought was interesting is how you went back and forth between like what life was like in 1916, especially down here at the, you know, the shore. Um, where did you get all your research and material for that? Well, at the time, the Internet was in its infancy, so I had to go to libraries and I, uh, I bought like three or four hundred books on Victorian and Edwardian life. You know, um, the fact that uh, one of my favorite uh, is things is to learn about the the Traymore Hotel in Atlantic City, and and the uh, the submarine grill that uh, you know N. C. Wyeth, who was this brilliant illustrator, very famous, who was the the this grandson of Jamie Wyeth, son of uh, the grandfather of Jamie Wyeth, father of Andrew Wyeth, had painted um, Neptune and scenes of mermaids on the side in 1916. This hotel and it had a circular um, aquarium of glass on the roof with sun streaming through it. You know, so some of the and, and of course, you could get arrested if you were a woman and showed your knees on the beach. And so it was a much different time. Yes. Thank you. So uh, you you mentioned that uh, it, some people thought it was a bull shark. Right. And, and a lot of people really think that because bull sharks can swim in. It's not freshwater. What's it called? Brackish that's water, it. That's right. It. Yes. So they actually, and I read your book many years ago, and I, I can't quite remember, they never actually found out for certain what fish did the attacks in 1916. Am I correct? Yes, you're right. And, it's, and George Burgess himself says this is a mystery that will be debated forever. Um, but, but, the, but do they, is it still a question whether it really was a great white versus a bull? Well, it is a question, and I'm, uh, you know, it's kind of like the Yankees and the Red Sox. You're on one side or the other, and, <laughs> and uh, I, on the great white shark side, I think it makes the most sense. George Burgess came up with the theory, uh, which actually the top ichthyologists, the young men, Robert Cushman Murphy and John Nichols, who were uh, young men in the new ichthyology department at the American Museum of Natural History and went on to careers as famous ichthyologists, said, this is, if it's a shark, it'd be a, a shark, a rogue shark that comes up from the south, which is what great whites do. And George has a theory that it was a kind of, you know, um, rogue sharks. Scientists hate the, you know, in fact, I was interviewed at NPR by Juan Williams when he was there. And he said, I have a scientist here who said it's impossible uh, that it's a rogue shark, that this is just, you know, and boy, my blood was boiling, but I kept nice and nice and calm. Um, and because uh, a lot of scientists think that, but George is a scientist, is a top shark attack scientist in the world, or one of them is a legend. And he has documented the presence of rogue sharks in, in Middle Eastern resorts that'll bite one person underwater and go and bite another person. And, and so, but he, it was believed that this is the first extended rogue shark attack. The other thing about the great white is at the end of the day, after the attacks, you see, I'm giving away the whole thing, you know? 
uh, after the attacks in um, Matawan, uh, within not too long, a few days later, a guy named Michael Schleiser, who was a lion tamer for Barnum and Bailey and a taxidermist, was attacked in a very small boat. You can see once again, Peter Benchley ripping off the story and kills with, with a, a broken oar, this shark, and takes human flesh out of it. And the shark, the shark was, the, and all the attacks stopped. And the shark was the size and description cited all the way along the coast. And one of the arguments against, uh, for the great white is, okay, so it was seen, the attack stopped, this fit the profile of that shark. And if there'd never been a, a this was, Charles Van Sant was the first uh, person in American history, meaning the first on the print page of the New York Times history being written, you know, to die of a shark attack in American history. Uh, if there was only one, why would there be all of a sudden four in, in you know, that it, it begs question. But the final thing is the bull shark theory is based on the idea that um, only a bull shark could go into this back in, you know, into, but when George went up there, he had done his thesis on this, on this environment, his thesis. And he said, um, actually, it's more like a marine embayment than it is a, a creek in a country town. Uh, it's certainly uh, the salinity and the depth of it to support a great white shark could easily come up here. It's not gonna raise a family there, but would do its business and escape. So one of the things I learned from Richard Walter, who the, the, the living Sherlock Holmes when I wrote The Murder Room, is it, it was in the Vidoc Society, would do at the Union League, would make his presentations, is that the truth in a case has to explain everything. You know, it, it, and that, the great whites, uh, it can't just explain some things. Well, you know, Jim really, or John really hated his wife. Well, that's does, it has to explain everything. The, you know, the dress, the color of the sweater, the blood, every piece of it has, the truth has to explain all of that. And the closest we can come to the truth explaining all of it, I think, is a great white theory. Whereas the bull shark theory is hinging just on this one salt thing, which this top scientist shot down. So that's my best answer on that. Yes. Where would you swim now? <laughs> <laughs> where, yeah, you know, where would you swim? You know, I, I, I really appreciate, uh, I've just chickened out. I mean, I love to swim, and but I was of that generation. I saw Jaws, and I believed it that it was going to happen. And you know, I hear that dun 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 dun. <laughs> so I, I think I would swim now. But it is amazing, it, it, you know. And the, the media always beats us up for being irrational. We're irrational, don't you know? It's not, but that irrational part of us is part of being human, you know. So I don't know. I do you swim? <laughs> Well, I think the odds are decidedly in our favor. I would definitely not swim in Cape Cod, though. I mean, I, all these stories you hear, it really is unbelievable. Uh, my, my, <laughs> Mike, I, I, have, I have one last question. It's my question. Yeah. So you have these sharks that have issues, apparently, these yeah. rogue sharks, right? Yeah. They are, is there any science behind them? Is there like a psychiatric shark guy that has yeah. tried to figure this out? Well, you could actually say that that's a good question. Uh, you know, serial killers who have like really violent mothers or something yeah well right. for, for the or, or fathers for the great white shark you could i guess make that case if you wanted to be a, a marine freudian because the great white shark gives birth to its pups and they come out like perfect size ready to go you know where's a squirrel where's a little baby you know whatever and uh but the first thing they have to do is escape mom mom turns around and tries to have dinner of them so you could say, if you were sympathetic to that kind of psychology, you could say, boy, the poor thing, no wonder it tried to kill everyone. It's amazing they're not all rogue sharks. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Mike Capuzzo. Thank Mike, thank you. Thank you very much. So I have another piece of interesting Union League uh, information from Jim before we end. And if you know anything about Jim, you know he loves cemeteries. And he does. Uh, and the historic cemetery, uh, Laurel Hill Cemetery, is the home of the entire Van Sant family, uh, including the young man who, who perished, right? Um, and if you want a tour of historic Laurel Hill with that, Jim is your man. Um, so again, Mike, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. We hope to see you back at the League House on September 14th for our big kickoff event. And I know many of you are staying um, for dinner, and I understand Shark is on the menu. So enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>